Okay, so I'm very honored to welcome Sonia Solikari, director of the Museum of the Home in London. So Sonia, you joined the Museum of the Home in 2017. And from 2018 to 2021, you've been undertaking an important transformation of your museum, transformation of its architecture, of its mission, and rebranding. So you explained to me that your goal was to revisit its role and to transform the museum into a lively and welcoming place for its neighborhood. So could you please uh, tell us more about the museum's transformation and how it reflects this goal? Um, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, thank you very much and thank you for having me today. Um, as you say, my name's Sonia um, and I want to talk about how we reinvented the Museum of the Home both as a physical space but also through our programming um, and some of our uh, learning and exhibition initiatives. So to talk about our neighbourhood and where we are, so we're located in Hackney, which you can see where the yellow star is there on the diagram. That's to the east of the centre of the city. Um, so what do we know about our neighbourhood? It's a relatively young borough. A quarter of its population is under 20 years old. It's culturally diverse with significant other, other white, black and Turkish Kurdish communities. Just over a third of residents are Christian. This is a lower percentage than uh, the London and England averages. Uh, there's significantly more people of the Jewish and Muslim faiths than is the average across the UK. 14.5% of residents disabled or have a long-term limiting illness. And in this, this one is interesting. Hackney was the 22nd most deprived local authority overall in England in the 2019 index. But previously, in 2010, it was ranked second. So actually, it's becoming less deprived. It's becoming more gentrified as people with more money move into the area, which is causing tensions um, locally and means that it's very difficult for people who are born into the area to continue to live there. So as a museum of the home, that's really interesting to us as something to explore. And then interestingly, nine out of ten residents say that Hackney is a place where people from different backgrounds get on well together. So I'm going to talk a bit more about this later because it really did inspire our vision. So about us, so we're the Museum of the Home located in historic buildings. So these were built in 1714 as almshouses, which was an early form of social housing. So these were almshouses from 1714 to 1914 when the residents moved out and the building was saved by the local council to become a museum. Originally, it was called the Jeffrey Museum, and I'm going to talk about the name change a bit uh, later. And it was designed as a museum of furniture history. It later became a museum more of domestic interior and finally into the Museum of the Home. But what inspired the redevelopment that we went through um, was that our visitor numbers were rising before we closed in 2018. So that was a really nice problem to have. But it meant that we had significant bottlenecks throughout the galleries um, visitors were finding it harder to find their way in and out. And also we have quite a large campus, in, including both indoor and outdoor spaces. And we wanted to make it easier for visitors to get inside and outside, both for those who are locals, so they could pop in very quickly, and for those who wanted a longer visit. So at the heart of the redevelopment was the better use of buildings. So interestingly, the museum had had a previous failed application to develop the site. Um, originally, the museum wanted to build a huge uh, new build on the corner of the site, which it was actually blocked by local communities. So we went back to the drawing board and thought, how can we make better use of our existing buildings? Um, and Right and Right Architects came up with a, with a, a scheme which opened up the buildings across three floors because originally they were only accessible on one middle floor. Um, this also had environmental benefits, so we didn't have um, the, the, the carbon footprint of creating a new building. And also we were able to install passive ventilation systems throughout the historic site. But also we were able to create new spaces both for learning for creativity for study so you can see our study center up on the top floor um, but also new galleries down on the bottom floor which I'll also be talking about later and you can see the relationship between the inside and outside which is really important for us to make more of that for our local neighborhoods we have gardens both sides on one side they're used very much for um, events uh, festival formats hire 
and on the other side, to, to the right of the image, um, these are historic gardens which show domestic um, outdoor spaces from 1600 to the present day. So it was really um, important that um, we, we had a couple of small new builds on the site and they were really for learning and creativity. So this is our new um, learning space and it's to one end of the garden site. Actually, this was really inspired by the needs of the local neighbourhood. So it's a really built up urban area with very little green space. Um, a lot of children in local schools don't have gardens or don't have access to green space very easily. So actually gardens are a huge part of our learning programme and it was really important to us that we brought our learning space direct into the outside. Uh, this is also serving us really well as we start to develop our eco-agenda and start to bring the idea of planting and biodiversity into the centre of what we do. So we were really interested with the idea of the useful museum. So how can a museum be of use to its local neighbourhood and how can it con can contribute to the public realm? So this photo is actually taken from Hoxton Station. So you can see how close we are to a transport hub. We're literally about three or four steps from the station to the museum. But previously, this part of the building wasn't open and accessible to the public. So the redevelopment was all about reorientating the site so that visitors could come in from the direction which most suited them. So actually now visitors can access the building from two directions, both the east and the west. You can see the seat there, which people are seated on just in front of the Museum of the Home sign and the railings. Uh, that was very important to us, so we actually gave something back to the public realm. So that is us providing seating spaces that people can sit and wait for people who are, who are maybe coming out of the station or wait for their train at the station. So it makes the whole site integral to the activity that is going on around it. Um, and cafe and retail, like rather than being something that is hived off as commercial activities, we actually decided to bring them right into the centre of how we thought about the museum as for its neighbourhood. So on the top left of that slide there, you can see a derelict pub, which was actually on the corner of the museum site. So we'd actually owned that for decades and it had become derelict. Uh, so we actually renovated that site into our new cafe so that the cafe had direct access onto the street. So we were giving something for the local community that they could easily access without ever visiting the museum itself if they didn't wish to, although we very much hope that people coming to see the cafe may find their way to the museum that way. So it's just different ways of accessing the heritage site. And because we reorientated the museum, it's much easier now for visitors to come in and just visit our shop quickly. We were really interested in the idea that we were creating a shop rather than a museum shop. Um, so this is a space where we hope that people can come in and just buy a birthday card or a Christmas card really easily and leave. And that is a valid visit to our site. So previously, before we shut, we were really well known for our rooms through time. So these are historic room sets from 1600 to the present day, showing the history of the UK home, but mainly middle class homes. So um, as part of the redevelopment, these weren't in scope, but we did a lot of reinterpretation of these spaces, including the creation of a new room on the bottom right, um, which was created by the artist Michael Macmillan. This was inspired by his upbringing and uh, growing up in Dalston, which is just down the road in a West Indian family. Um, and so we added this to our, our suite of rooms to start to be able to speak more about relevant experience locally so people could start to see themselves in the rooms that we represented. However, the redevelopment project was all about new spaces. So we knew we had our room sets, but we wanted to create galleries which were more thematic and asked really fundamental questions about the nature of home. So our new home galleries, the big question is, what does home mean to you? That's the question that we kind of ask each and every visitor who's coming into the site. Like, how is what you're seeing in our museum both the same and different from your own experience of home? So we've mixed objects that may have been quite expensive at the time of their purchase with objects that maybe were more accessible. Um, we ask questions such as um, how, how did the objects come into your home? Were they bought? Were they purchased? Were they swapped? Do you like them? Do you not like them? Are you living with stuff? Um, do you feel guilty about? Do you feel that you have to get out grandmother's china every time she visits? And so these are all the elements that make up the history of the home. We're also interested in creating a fuller picture of home, so not just a sentimental idea of the past. So homes are both positive and negative spaces. That can change year on year, it can change hourly, it can change daily. 
And we wanted to get an element of the fact that homes are also quite challenging and hard spaces to maintain. So we look at things like housework, gender and housework. We look at how technology has changed the home. Um, and we look at the idea of identity and belonging um, as well. So our new home galleries, because we were building in the grade one listed building, which were almshouse spaces, they're built on a really domestic scale. So they're really small galleries, but we use that to our advantage so that visitors can get up really, really close to objects. Colour and materiality were super, super important to us in, in the idea of building spaces that were welcoming. So we wanted them to be bright and engaging. We also wanted to break up the visitor journey so people are aware that they were entering different rooms and different spaces as you do when you move around your own home or domestic environment. On the right hand side there, you can see um, a design conceit by ZMMA, the designers, where they've put wallpaper behind each of the different text panels in the room. So this is something that we thought that visitors might not necessarily notice on their first visit, but it's very much something for people to like, notice maybe on their second or third. And we've got lots of details throughout the galleries that people who are more familiar with us can start to notice and appreciate the more they visit. Light, daylight and views. So lighting was really important to us as well, especially in the relationship of the building to its neighbourhood. So we wanted people to know wherever they were on the site, their relationship to the outside. Um, so actually, we have let natural daylight into the galleries. So we do have UV filters on the windows, but actually we did a lot of light modelling as well to work out when the sun um, hit the galleries at what time of day. So we just pulled the blinds down um, or, or put the blinds up at that moment in the day. That is done manually by our visitor experience team. And that allow, allows us to bring natural light into the spaces. And vignettes. Um, so although we have our historically um, inspired rooms upstairs, we were also wanting to bring a, a sense of theatre into the idea of the home. So you can see on the left hand side, that's one of our feedback spaces and it's inspired by the idea of the kitchen. We wanted to build a kitchen that was the kitchen that was everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So it didn't suggest too much a particular socio-economic background, although there is inevitably um, references within there to particular um, fashions and taste. Um, but it was very much inspired by the idea that the kitchen has historically been a centre for discussion and debate, that the kitchen table can be a kind of a political space um, and a space for families to um, you know, discuss what they think and feel about what's going on in, in the day. So we ask questions here. Uh, we can ask really deep questions, like what do you think the future of the home is? What does the climate crisis mean for you in the home? But we can also ask really fun questions, like do you wear shoes in the home or not? Do you take, do you take them off when you enter? So we, we get a really like mixed idea of kind of the everyday, um, but also the bigger picture. And on the right-hand side is a 1990s vignette. This is one of the most popular um, interactors that, that we have. It's, visitors can play Super Mario Kart from the 1990s while sitting on a 1990s sofa with 1990s wallpaper. So again, creating that kind of immersive experience. Personal stories. So we have a manifesto for the museum and one of the key parts of that manifesto is that personal stories are our lifeblood. So where we're different to somewhere like the V&A or the Design Museum is that we say that design is important but it has to be lived. So we want to know what happens to that sofa when it leaves the showroom. So although we are interested in the designer and the maker, we want to know whether it was comfortable or not. We want to know whether someone used it, whether they enjoyed using it. And these are all parts of the stories that we are um, telling, but also the questions that we're asking in our galleries. And we do that through a number of means. So there are interactives, touch objects. There's, there's use of the architecture with quotes on the wall. Um, and we try and sort of break down so that people can get um, what we call a magazine experience. So the museum as a magazine, which you can either dip into and just read a small piece or you can dive into and read a whole feature. And that's kind of how we see our relationship with our visitors. So this is an example, um, again, in terms of bringing the gardens to life. This was a project that we did with local residents um, called the Hackney Elders. And again, these, these are people who were talking about how their gardens were a great source of well-being for them in old age, but also really hard to maintain. So again, that, there's a, two sides um, to our experience of home. 
So our documenting homes collection is a key part of our collection. This is something that we've been doing for over 10 years. It's a survey-based way of collecting. So we go into local homes and we ask people a series of questions. And then we ask them to donate photographs um, of themselves historically or, or, or now. Um, or sometimes we take the photographs as ourselves. But what it means is that we are building up over time a really good... Um, sample representation of how people live um, at the moment locally but we hope to roll this out nationally and internationally and in fact when we went into lockdown we used this collecting model in order to um, understand better how people were living during covid but it's important to us that in our galleries we found a way of displaying this so we've used like this kind of quite accessible idea of photographs that are just propped up rather than blowing them up as if they're artworks they still remain like your personal photograph collection so co-curation has been at the heart of the new galleries. So we've been working with local communities in order to generate content. So we have a really active for forum, community forum, called the Faith and Culture Forum. They sometimes operate as critical friends for us, um, but sometimes also as curators. We showed them a space and said, we need you to fill the, this space with something. It, can, it could be anything. And they were really keen that, that they wanted to make a film about local homes and especially about shelves and fire and mantelpieces and how people's display of objects in the home are kind of microcosms of their own life and their own personal history. So we helped them to commission a local filmmaker, Mina Salimi, um, and Mina went into local homes in order to create this um, wonderful film and resource that is now on display in the galleries and in sign, sign interpreted as well. So... Um, the Museum of the Home um, is, is an identity which we actually developed in the middle of doing our physical renovation. So we'd already closed for redevelopment. And actually, as we started to think through some of these ideas and we started to see how collections were shaping up and the displays were shaping up, it gave us the confidence to move to being from the Jeffrey Museum of the Home to just the Museum of the Home. We thought we can do this um, and this is something which will relate much more easily to our visitors. Um, there was a real struggle with people understanding what the Jeffrey Museum was, um, whereas the Museum of the Home is much more accessible and everybody understands what they, what they may be encountering when they come to visit us. So I think that's a bit unusual because often people sort of get their vision and their mission before they embark on a capital project, but actually the capital project in this case was a catalyst for us pushing our vision and mission much further. So we came the place to reveal and rethink the ways we live in order to live better together. And the last bit of that, live better together, which was inspired by what Hackney residents said epitomised the local area, is something which has pushed us further to be a museum with a social mission. And some of you may have caught my colleague Lucy Littlewood's panel talk earlier um, about that, and I'll talk about it a bit more in a moment. So that idea of the museum of the home um, was really centred on the idea of identity and belonging. So we pushed out a campaign when we were reopening the museum, which was all about welcome home and, again, what does home mean to you? So this was the campaign that we went out with locally, the idea that it's your home, um, it's your museum, it's, it's, it's a space where you should feel welcome um, and a sense of belonging. Um, and that was a successful campaign, which, although we were open during COVID, so there were restrictions, um, you know, it meant that lots of people were waiting to visit us as soon as we opened our doors. So the campaign for change, which I mentioned earlier, the Live Better Together part of our new vision. Um, so this is really a way in which we want to make a difference, um, both locally and nationally. So um, the campaign for change is something where um, we look very much look to a partnership model in order to identify and, and tackle some of the major issues of the day relating to home. The first one is focusing on homelessness, and we're looking particularly at hidden female homelessness. And we've partnered with the um, London Homeless Collective, which is a pan-London collective of charities, both big and small, uh, which are tackling homelessness at the moment. So the way that works is that we as a museum have got the power and the space to tell engaging stories and to raise awareness and to talk more about homelessness in our spaces but the actual charities have got the experience um, and the knowledge to deliver on the ground and also to help to advise us um, about how we, how we speak about homelessness and what that might mean in the museum space. 
So we jointly fundraise, um, and everything that we fundraise, 70% goes, um, so 100% goes back into the campaign, but 70% goes to the museum and our programming so that we can continue to push the message out about what female hidden homelessness might mean, and 30% goes um, to making real and direct change. So we've helped to fund the first 24-hour uh, drop-in centre for women um, experiencing homelessness. That's in Marylebone in London and also a pan-London strategy, which is bringing together local authorities and charities to start to, be, to bring about a coordinated approach to tackling homelessness. So more dynamic rooms through time. So I mentioned that the artist Michael McMillan had created a new room. Um, what's different about this room is he created it with the aim uh, that it could be interactive, not with our visitors at the moment, but that we can invite particular partners to come into that space and engage with it. So artists, activists, we've done film recordings, we've done music events, all in the room to try and break down that fourth wall in, in that theatre uh, arrangement so that actually um, the, the rooms are a little bit more porous than they were. This is actually proving really inspiring to us as to how we may start to develop the rooms through time next. And out and about, it was interesting in the panel that's just been um, about how one brings the museum out into the community. So we quickly identified that tea was something that was common to a lot of different cultures as a way of welcoming people into, into the home. So what we've got is um, we partnered with artists Yara and Davina, who are locally based, to um, have a tea truck which goes out into the local community. Um, the tea is free, so people can come up and they can blend their own tea and they can have a conversation with um, our curators um, and the idea is that they're also blending a tea for Hackney and that's going to be sold in our shop and the profits will help us to continue the free teas. So protest and change, so it hasn't all been smooth sailing. Um, the Jeffrey Museum that I, that I mentioned we were called beforehand was actually named after Sir Robert Jeffrey who had made part of his money from investments in transatlantic slavery. Um, in May 2020, um, in wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and the Colston statue being toppled in Bristol Harbour, um, attention was brought to other statues uh, within the UK, including ours on the front of our building. There's been major protests and calls for the statue to be moved. We conducted a local con consultation in which 70% of local residents um, and visitors said that they would like the statue moved. In the middle of the consultation, however, the government um, confirmed its own um, approach to statues in the public realm. And because we are government funded, we are currently obliged to abide by that current legislation, which is that statues should not be moved from public spaces. So we're in um, a continued conversation with the government about the possibilities for the future of the statue. Um, we feel that we could move it elsewhere on site where we can better interpret it. But there's no denying that this has caused major schisms within our local neighbourhood um, and it's something that we're looking to rebuild. So when we reopened, um, we had a, a project by local London-based artists called Blackbird Collective. They did a number of banners on our front lawns um, looking at more marginalised voices. These are very statuesque in their style, so they were asking the correct question, who should be venerated? So I've speed up. Um, open dialogue, so we've commissioned film content looking at the histories of the site, but also engaging um, local young people who tend to, at the moment, like to communicate through poetry and spoken word. So that's very much a project which we're developing for people to have a voice um, about the museum and its history. And we're thinking really seriously about how we redo the rooms, like which room sets we, um, which stories we tell, whose stories we tell. Um, and also about the colonial history of objects in the UK home. Uh, we're, this, is, this is just an image of um, the room to rethink, where we are currently engaging visitors in what the future of the museum could be. And, I'll speed up. and we've moved to a format of festival programming as well. So it's not that we're moving away from exhibitions, but now that we've got this wonderful new campus... We're moving towards um, more festival events, which means that we can have a combination of music, food, talks, tours, and exhibition elements all in one space. And finally, um, inspiring collaborations. So we're looking really carefully about the artists that we partner with and the message that we want to get across about the home. So this was a really wonderful collaboration with the poet Lem Sisse and a local artist, Morag Myerskoff, um, said the sun to the moon, said the head to the heart. We have more in common 
and sets us apart. That's it. Thank you so much, dear Sonia. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, your strategy and um, how you've been transforming your museum and also the um, difficult situation you had with the, with the statue. Um, so, are there questions from the audience maybe to Sonia? Yes, please. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I just wanted to ask you something because it looks rather nice and rather extraordinary, all of the work you've done, so well done. But is there something you are not quite happy with it, really? Something yeah, you missed the point or something you, you could have done it better if you have time or if you had the people, I don't know, for whatever reason could be that. Um, yes, definitely. So in physical terms, I think we concentrated a lot on the new entrance, the image that I showed from the station. But actually, I think we ignored the other side of the building. So there's more that we could do to welcome people to the site because it looks a bit foreboding with all of those doors and visitors find it difficult to access. So from a physical point of view, there's definitely that. Um, but if we had our time again, I think we would probably look at the rooms alongside the new home galleries because actually there are sort of quite two different um, offers at the moment. In some ways that's worked in our favour because I think those people who knew the old museum feel comforted that those displays are still there but in other ways I think people are visiting and saying we don't understand how the new and the old vision are, are, are gelling together so there's definitely that, that tension but we're getting onto the rooms uh, next so yeah, it swings around about. And just the other things, what about the budget things? Because we haven't yeah. talked about money, and money is something rather important. Yeah, that, that you mean how we funded yeah, the sure. yeah. project? So we got, um, so the project was 18.8 million. We got 12.8 million from the National Lottery Fund. So that's, um, you know, the Trust Foundation within the UK. Um, and then we got a loan from local government, which we're paying back um, and also we fundraised a lot from private individuals private trusts and foundations to make the rest of it thanks a lot yeah oui bonjour est-ce que vous avez déjà eu des retours des retours have you already had feedback from your visitors on the changes that you've made and what are their expectations beyond that what are their needs anything else yeah, that's a really interesting question because we get a really range of responses from our visitors. So some, some visitors uh, love the idea that we're now asking, um, we're, we're now exploring more diverse stories of home. That's something which has brought a lot of new visitors to the site um, and which is allowing us to engage with really exciting partners. But then also we do get a lot of feedback from visitors who are concerned um, about the new approach and you know, would like it to be, I suppose, more of a sentimental view of the British home. Um, and you know, they're a bit wary of the new approach. So we are trying to manage those two bits of feedback um, as we go forward. So although we know that we want to fundamentally redo the rooms, um, our question is you know, we don't want to alienate existing audiences too much. So that's a really big question for us as we, as we go forward bringing in the feedback that we're getting. It's a year after opening, so we've got quite a bit of feedback already, but we're going to be doing more targeted forum work uh, with a lot of our visitors to really understand what they want and need. Okay, huge thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank, thank you for having so me. Much. <laughs>